Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Arkansas Arts Center's Sparking Dialogue Through Drama. I'm Katie Campbell, the Director of Children's Theater and Performing Arts, and we'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional land of the Quapaw people. Today's program is the first in this series and part of the Arts Center's Social Impact Initiative. Sparking Dialogue uses theatrical plays to provide space for meaningful conversations at home and in the community. Our drama today is intended for families with children six and up and is called Water Gun Song by playwright, poet, and change maker Idris Goodwin, in which a parent tries to explain to a child why a water gun isn't simply a toy. Following a reading of the play, our moderator, Janelle McBride, will kick off our discussion with the actors, director, and panelists. The performance will serve as a jumping off point for discussion around race and anti-racism. And you can join in the conversation by using the question and answer function or comment section throughout the program. Please feel free to ask questions and we will address as many as we can during the discussion. Once again, thank you for joining us. And now, Water Gun Song. Are you listening? Uh-huh. You just press this button and it will take off my fish. Just by pressing a button. Cindy had the best toys. That's great, Sam. Yeah, so, so awesome, so awesome. That's not all, that's not all. No? They have a dog and a cat. In 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 Guana, can you believe that? And an iguana. Yep, yep. His name is Ivan. Ivan and Guana. And guess what the cat name is? Yeah, that's real nice. Are you listening? Uh, yeah. I'm I'm listening. I asked I you if you can guess the cat's name and you said that real nice i misunderstood you i'm listening see i put my phone down the cat name guess what is the cat's name try and guess um furball no well, Obama. Really? Yep. Uh, that's so cute. Yeah, because he is half black and half white. I'm sorry, what? Some of the cat fur is black and some is. Sure, I get, yeah, I got it. It's so much fun at Cindy's house. Mm-hmm. Well, how, are, how are Cindy's parents toward you? What do you mean? How do they treat you? What do you mean? Are they nice to you? Of course they're nice to me. I mean, do they ever say anything that makes you you know, feel uncomfortable. No, Cindy's my friend. Because you can tell me if they do. You know, matter of fact, I need you to tell me if they do. It's okay. We just have fun. Hey, hey, you know what else? What else? We had a huge water fight. Oh, yeah? It was so cool. Cindy's mom filled this bucket up with water balloon and buckets. And you know what else? What else? Uh, what else? Oh, nothing. Well, now you got me curious. Got me all curious. Tell me. Nothing.
was it water guns? Was it water guns, Sam? Okay, it's okay. I'm not mad. You're not? No, I understand. You were having fun. It was so much fun. And when you're at someone else's house, it's fine. It was so much fun. Cindy had this one that shoots water so far. Oh yeah? So far. What, what did Cindy, but Cindy knows that when she comes here, we don't do that, right? I told her that. Oh yeah? Yeah, I told her and her mom and her dad. And what did they say? They didn't say anything. Nothing? No, nope, just did like this. Mm. What did you say? I said we can't play water guns at my house. Did you say why? No. Well, you have to say why. I don't know why. Of course you know why. I don't know why. Sam, come on, we talked about this. But I don't understand. A water gun is plastic and it's colorful and it's just water and it's not for real. But it's a gun. For water, there are guns that light up and make noise. Guns that they're like space alien guns. Okay, you remember when it was our day to bring snacks to your whole class, we made sure to find something everyone could eat, right? Yes. Why did we do that? Because some kids couldn't have dairy or gluten or meat. We did that to be considerate of other people's allergies. You know what happens when people have, when people's allergies act up? They don't feel good. Right. They don't feel good. They get sick. Well, guns make me feel a little sick. Even if it's a toy, if it has a barrel and a trigger, I have a reaction. What kind? Well, you know how some nights you have bad dreams? Yes. Well, I have them sometimes, in the daytime, even when I'm awake. And when I think of you with guns, even toys, I have these quick bad dreams in my head. What kind? Something happens when toys are in the hands of children, especially little brown-skinned children like you. What happened to them? Well, sometimes grown-ups can't tell the difference between something being a toy and being real, even if you're playing. Not everybody is in on the game. Uh, I have an idea. What's your idea? To let everyone know we just playing, we can sing a song. What kind of song? The water gun song. Mm. How's the water gun song go? Water gun, water gun, it's so fun. It's so fun. Sing it with me. Sing it with me. Water, water gun, gun, water gun. It's so, it's so fun. fun. It's, it's so fun. fun. It's just a game. It's not real. It's just pretend. It's not real. It's just, it's a, just game. a game. It's, it's not, not real. real. It's just, it's pretend. just pretend. It's, it's not, not real. real. What about that? Maybe that will help. Maybe. Either way, I like it. When you get the bad dream, you can sing that song. Okay.
Oh, you know what else? Hey, you know that Obama, the person, not the cat, is more than just his colors, right? Of course. Okay, just making sure. How about nunchucks? Can I have nunchucks in the house? We'll talk about it. Hey, you know what else? Thank you all so much. That was wonderful. I, 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 I know you can't feel the applause from uh, an online performance. Thank you. <laughs> So, so Yay, much. Michael. That was beautiful. <laughs> Good job. Michael, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Janelle McBride, and I'm a nonprofit consultant in Little Rock. My company is called the Giovanna Group. I have a background in theater. Um, it's where I started as an actor and I'm gonna moderate us through this conversation today um, about Water Gun Song. So first I wanna introduce um, our panelists today. We're gonna have Agnolia B. Gay. And, and when, I, when I introduce your name, if you guys could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, we have Agnolia B. Gay, the director of um, the performance Ms. Gay, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Agnolia Gay. I am um, originally from um, Arkansas. I grew up in Little Rock School District, and now I am teaching at the same high school that I graduated from. Uh, I'm at Parkview High School right now, and I've been teaching for 24 years in um, oral communications and, and theater is the area that I've been working in. So I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Arkansas State University. And um, it's beautiful to be able to teach what I love. Theater um, is something that I love to do. And it was a joy just being able to work with this cast. Thank you. And I'm one of your proud students too. And I appreciate the impact you have had on my life. <laughs> Thank you. We have Michael Elliott. Yes. Hi, you did such a wonderful job today. Thank you. Where do you go to school? Booker Arts. Booker Arts, okay. Thank you. And um, how old are you? Eight. Eight years old. Well, you did a magnificent job today. We'll ask you a question just in a second once we get everybody introduced, okay? Okay. Thank you. Berta Davenport Boer. Hi, I'm Verda. I am a local actor, mom, costume designer. I grew up in the Little Rock School District as well. Um, I've worked at the Art Center a number of times, some of the best joys of my life. Um, and my children are a product right now of the Little Rock School District and thankfully the theater department. Unfortunately, not with Miss Gay, but I'm sure that they have worked with a number of students who have been so. I'm now fortunate to say that I have also too. So, hi. Hi, thank you for your talent and your time to this project. It is wonderful to see you again and to know that we have um, this community of actresses here. This is so wonderful to be with you guys today. Um, and we have Dr. Alexis Davis. Hello everyone, sorry, I was trying to get my video and unmute at the same time. My name is Dr. Alexis Davis. I am a clinical psychologist. I'm an independent scholar and healer. Um, I'm also a hip hopologist. So I use hip hop to funnel mental health to the black community. And that's my passion. Thank you. Um, we know how important mental health is um, in our community. Thank you for your services. I can't wait to hear more about your hip hop. Oh, it sounds fascinating. We have uh, Ryan Davis. Hey, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you to Verda and to Michael for that uh, very powerful performance. I didn't realize that kind of power could be packed into to such a 
such a short script, and a short time, and even virtually. Um, but um, anyhow, I am Ryan D. Davis. I'm a, a parent, uh, director of UA Little Rock Children International, uh, and a great admirer of theater. And I have to add that my favorite play, uh, one of my favorite plays, is very similar in context to what we just saw. It's a play by Aisha Rahman called uh, The Mojo and the Say So. Uh, my other favorite play is Joe Turner's Come and Gone, just in case anybody wants to get out there and produce that. So, uh, yes, indeed. Glad to be a part of this panel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your service to Children International. And yes, that is an amazing show. We should, you should be the one to get it going and then we'll all join behind you. <laughs> we have Cat Guest. Good afternoon, uh, Michael. You did an excellent job. Congratulations. I am um, also a native Arkansan from right here in Little Rock, a practicing attorney, a lover of books, mom and chief. I have elementary aged uh, uh, children who also enjoy the children's theater. We've taken classes and attended performances and are looking forward to getting back to attending performances. And I am passionate about uh, certainly community engagement, particularly youth initiatives. So happy to be here today. Thank you all so much again for your time. I'm gonna get started in with our questions now. And I know we have um, some people out there online. If you have a question, you can send it um, to <laughs> us and we will be able to ask it today. So Michael, I want to start with you. And my first questions are going to be just about performing online. What was it like for you to perform for us today virtually on your laptop? It felt good and scary. Good and scary at the same time, right? <laughs> Wonderful. So did you connect with your character? Was it the same? Do you have anything in common um, with the character in the play? Mm. No. No, no. <laughs> Do you ever play with water guns? I you, have before. I forgot which they go. It was a long time. It's a I was long probably time. like five or six. Okay. And did you like playing with him? Did you have fun? Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, I just really want you to know today that you did an amazing job. And we all believed every word that you said. And we are all so very proud of you. Thank you for performing today. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Um, and Agnolia, I'm wondering if you can tell us what it was like to direct virtually. And I think what we're getting at, if anybody has anything they want to add to this, um, is how do we think that performing online might fit into the bigger tapestry of theater and dance, theater, arts, um, in light of the fact that it can sometimes be a safer place uh, for African Americans to be, for Black people to be perceived and to be able to control uh, how people perceive you. Or it could have the opposite effect, right? It could be a little bit more damaging. So I'm just curious to know, Miss um, Gay, what it was like to direct online. And then for anyone else, um, how you think this experience might fit into the larger tapestry of theater moving forward? Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, I was definitely um, wondering myself what this was going to look like. I must admit that this was my first time um, directing virtually. However, I always knew that it was a possibility. When everything started happening really crazy in March, I, as an actress and performer, had already started uh, getting my, my head together about how I was going to make this work for my theater students. And so it turned out to me, I mean, just from what you saw, the power of what happened, even though these two characters are in two totally separate places, I think the message came forth. And so uh, that's what any author could ask for. Is my message coming through? Did these characters portray um, uh, with believability? And so 
um, I was working with some really wonderful, um, a, a wonderful cast in that Michael for me was just so innocent, so believable. Um, he followed directions so well and he was a natural. Um, obviously we have a powerhouse actress over here in Verda and she, um, they already had the strength. And so if you are already working with the ability to, to bring messages and, and ex convey them um, with the power that they did today, it makes it really easy for the director. And, and so just the vision, the vision of bringing uh, this to uh, our youth today, I think is just absolutely wonderful. And I just wanna thank the Arkansas Arts Center for the opportunity to be a part of this really necessary, considering you know the difficult times that we're in, to be able to give this form of expression, continue to give this form of expression to um, not only actresses, but just our, our, our youth and our families as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talent, Inverta. I know. Um... That is exactly right. Uh, I haven't directed anything online, but when you come with the wealth of experience that you do, um, can you tell us a little bit about what the experience of performing on like, online was like for you? Have you done it before? And do you think that, um, that it's something we should continue or can continue to move into the future even past the pandemic? I have been lucky enough to do a performance online, like a reading um, with the Shakespeare, Arkansas Shakespeare. Um, and it was, this of course, with fewer people was easier. And, um, but it was really nice to to explore that script with, with Michael. I was wondering how challenging it would be to work with someone who, you know, Michael didn't have a ton of experience online like I don't either so I was just wondering how we would do it but Miss Gay you know was we were able to create a community within ourselves and then also have that discussion and to to you know look at some of the questions and the reality is this script is so perfectly written for this I mean obviously um the playwright knew exactly what he was wanting to bring forward and I mean just simply having uh, the two characters and having that one small discussion it's really nice to be able to delve into it and then to open that up for for conversation so yeah it's been it was kind of fun I like it yeah awesome awesome wonderful so let's get into talking about that very important conversation um, watching this performance I know every parent, right, um, has that moment of, is my child okay, right? And we know that as Black parents, we have that moment um, when we know that our children might be experiencing racism or oppression on some level. We know that it's coming. Can you talk about what it was like to, ha to, to, to have that moment? in the script um, and then like how you've had that moment in your own life. Have you had that um, moment in your own life? Yeah, I, what I loved in this process is we read through it and then Agnolia suggested, you know, to break down those moments and to go a little bit deeper. And the minute we went deeper, it changed the entire dynamic of the, of the whole thing and it also I mean it's very straightforward obviously and then looking into Michael's face and having to like think through what like the script is actually talking about like she said what and how do you do what and you know just the whole idea of having a gun and looking at Michael playing with a gun and maybe having someone possibly misunderstand that situation and something like that happening to someone I care about and love it's just you know, it's it's easy to go there. It's not a hard thing. Seeing how, like you said, I did, I have experienced that. I I was one of those parents, or am. I mean, luckily he's 18 now. He's an adult, but still, I'm freaking out. Um, we didn't. I didn't buy guns to be played with in my home. I just didn't want. I, night like at that moment in time, I was like thinking, I just don't want them to to deal with aggression or look at it you know, just the gun itself. And let alone, like, eventually it came to me. I love how naive 
I liked to be. It came to me like when there was a, I forget the name of the, the young man, there was a young man who was in cosplay and he had a sword and I saw it online and he had a sword and he was injured and because he was carrying a sword and the adults around him considered him a threat. He was a young African-American man. And that's when I was like, wait, whoa, it's not even just the gun factor. It's just, it's, wait, how is he, my kid, my daughter, my son going to be perceived in the world? You know, and he's a kid. Luckily, my kids look like kids and they, yes, they were black, but what about an African-American kid who also looked older than they are? You know, I don't know, I still struggle. I mean, even more so now with, you know, sending my kids out into the world and feeling that they're safe and prepared. May I, I think that's forever. Really, not to move away from that, but I'd like to know how Ms. Larkin decided to utilize this particular, how did they choose this particular um, play? And um, I definitely uh, think it was necessary, it was important, but just wanna just kind of know how did you come about bringing this in? I apologize, I just wanted to, be, before we go deeper, Janelle, if that's okay. I think that is a wonderful question. And Aaron, I'm sorry I did not give you a moment to introduce yourself, if you would, please. Uh, and, and, and also tell us how you all, how, how did you all decide on Water Gun Song? Sure, sure. Um, my name's Erin Larkin. I'm a costume designer at the Children's Theater. I'm also a mother of two sons, two biracial black sons. Um, so this this uh, piece really addresses our family and things that we talk about constantly. Um, but I, you know, before this started, my son said to me too, he said, um, you know, the only time I've seen a gun that looks realistic, like a black gun, as a toy is in a dollar store. He's like, why is that? Why is it in a dollar store? You only see, you know, so he, I thought that was an interesting little insight he had. Um, this piece is a part of a trio that um, uh, open source plays that uh, was put out, put out by uh, Idris Goodwin and the National Conglomeration of Children's Theaters, um, particularly in this time to address some of these issues. And this play was the one that um, addressed younger audiences, starting with kind of age six. And that's really where a lot of our core audience is, is some of those, those um, kinders and pre and those early kind of about fifth grade, our audience starts really kind of aging into some of the more, you know, preteen kind of, kind of material. So we really thought this was something that would reach our, uh, would reach our demographic. Um, and it just, it's kind of spoke to you know, some of the things we talked about with our family, so. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm curious to know um, more about your family, but I do want to put in as well that, I mean, the Arkansas Art Center has seen so many children uh, come through um, there to learn more about theater arts in general, but also to see these plays. And so you guys have played a really important role um, in what children are consuming here. I know schools go on field trips there and there's just been, um, an incredible amount of work you guys have put out for that. So thank you for using that, this platform and using that space to have this conversation. Appreciate that. And, and I would also thank like you. to say, um, uh, thank you, Ms. Larkin, but 24 years I've been engaged in theater um, as an adult. Um, and as a youth, I didn't understand that the Arkansas Arts Center was available to me. And so I appreciate this play because it's inclusive. And a lot of the plays that have been in the Arkansas Arts Center have not been inclusive. And I just wanted to be transparent about how I felt about that. And that is one of the reasons I wanted to ask. And so it is important to me about the intentionalness. Uh, say that word for me, Janelle. The, the intentionalness, if that's a word, that, yeah, it is. Uh, of this particular play specifically uh, being uh, made available so that our youth, um, youth of color, can see uh, these characters, characters that look like them. And so again, I want to say thank you because of that. 
Yes, thank you. And we're, and we're excited about uh, Mr. Goodwin's work. He's got been really making waves in the children's theater scene. Um, he's got an adaption of um, J Jason Reynolds' Ghost, which does play to more of a preteen audience. Of course, this is pre-pandemic. Um, so it's been playing around the country. Really, We really hope to see some of those kinds of pieces that do address those audiences that we lose. Mm -hmm. um, and we really thank Michael for coming on and, and playing a part. Michael, I want to say that I really saw in rehearsal, it was one thing, when you got an audience, you lit up. <laughs> I can see that natural talent just pop out. So thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. did amazing. So I want to ask the doctor, Dr. Alexis Davis and Ryan Davis, you guys work with children um, and, and child psychology and educating children. I'm curious to know what the scientific basis is, what is happening to Black parents when they have to have this conversation, right? What is happening to children um, at the psychological level, Dr. Davis and, and, and Ryan D. Davis, what do you see uh, children dealing with with regard to experiencing racism and, and with toys or things that um, they may not typically be seen like in, the, in their normal lives? Um, we'll start with Dr. Alexis Davis, if we could. Awesome. That's a really great question. And when I was preparing for this, I looked over the script, watched the video that was sent, um, and it, it directly led me to some, some interesting songs and information. Um, and the information that I first went to was Dr. Robert L. Williams, uh, who was a clinical psychologist as well, book on raising Black kids to be okay. And he talks about Black parents as the, um, the Afro-side agents, if you will. And so Black parents are the agents through which Black identity formation is cultivated for their children. And we're talking about this as just an isolated conversation, but this is a conversation that goes <laughs> on throughout the development of our children. Um, so I think this play is really great at bringing that to the forefront because um, the child in this play is seven years old. So that goes to highlight, right? Um, and then also it even highlights space in the context of being African-American. So Dr. Robert O. Williams talks about Afrocentric space and Anglo-centric space. And so when the mom asks, you know, well, how does Cindy parents talk to you? Like, how do they treat you, right? That shows that as Black parents, we must be mindful of the spaces in which our children are navigating in and preparing them to navigate in more than just those Afrocentric spaces, right? Um, because we live in a world that is also very Anglo-centric, if we're being honest about it. Um, and then also, I'm sorry, this is just a great play. Let me just say that too. I think Idris Goodwin did a very great job of putting this in a context where both children can take this in, but then the parents can take it in as well and get some great antidotes. Um, I think it was a great point as a child, Sam brought up music, right? Because that's where I come in as a hip hopologist. Um, that goes to show that children really can heal through music. That is a fun point with them. If we want them to clean, we do clean up, clean up. Like, we have all these songs that are associated with that. And so I think it's important that we also, as um, people of African descent, take on our, our um, feeling in that part too. So it took me to Nas, um, that's where I was taken. And I think that if, if we think about Nas, right, we have great opportunities to instill in our children these these power moments, right? Whose world is this? We can couple whose world is this with a conversation about navigating this world as a child who is of African descent, right? And ending that, we love call and response. Anywhere you go with Black people, you're gonna hear some call and response, right? So ending it with a call and response, whose world is this? And having your child respond, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. That's empowering for our children. So not only does this play highlight, you know, the importance of having these conversations, being open, um, allowing children to stay in children's place and not bringing them into adulthood so fast, like the world may do our children often. Um, it just highlights so many great aspects. And I don't wanna go on too much of a tangent, um, but that is some of my feedback and just also ways that we can incorporate um, things that help our children grasp these sometimes heavy messages. Thank you so much for lifting that up. That is it. It is. Yeah, absolutely. How do we keep our kids kids? 
when um, when they're dealing with situations that are so incredibly violent, uh, physically and mentally, right? And we, we know one of the ways Black people have always done that is through song, right? And it's anyway, um, but especially for kids, right? And I do, I love that it ends in that way. And I love that you're working with hip hop in the same way. So thank you for that. Ryan Davis, did you have, yes, Sam, did you have any, um, any thoughts about that when you work with children at Children's International? Do you see these moments happening with parents? Yeah, yeah. Now that you have children as well, and you have experienced it as well, so if you have thoughts about that either uh, at in either situation. Sure, and I mean, you know, I see it in both cases, but probably, um, you know, certainly uh, in in high fi in in my own situation as a parent, uh, Doctor Davis got me hype over here. That nasty Nasir Ek, nasty Nasir Jones. The world is mine, it's my whose world is this? And it's funny. It's not funny. It's also not coincidental. But my girls love that song. It's one of the the, the few nine songs that uh, I can share with them uh, for appropriateness sake. And it's an affirming message. And I'm going to lift that up because, you know, there's this, um, you know, I think about my life and, and the fact that my parents were very uh, intentional about lifting up, um, lifting up and affirming, you know, my blackness. You know, not 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 that I should wear it emblematically, but that it, it, it's a reality of who I am, and it's a beautiful thing. And I was raised in the bosom of of, of, of pieces and parts of the black community, uh, the black church in particular. You know, black church is so often, and, and yet it still is one of those first places where you are affirmed as a human being, as a creation of the Creator, um, as somebody who has the agency to speak in front of audiences. Uh, and so those spaces are important, community spaces. Uh, 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 and, and so on and so forth. And um, you know, also, I was thinking back to something that Berta said, and you know, I think uh, for a lot of us, we've we've seen enough of, uh, if only with uh, the the unfortunate murder of Tamir Rice, uh, how how black kids are 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 seen uh, by and large in society. And I think some of our responses, well, you know, water is wet, and you know, I, and it's good um, to to know something uh, uh, to know something you know to be true anecdotally. Uh, can be confirmed and conflated with analysis. And in about 2015, the American uh, Psychological Association, um, you know, uh, published a, a study that, that says that uh, black boys as young as 10 are proven to not be given the same presumption of childhood innocence as their white peers. And instead, they're considered, excuse me, to be much older than what they are, much older they're perceived to be uh, guilty and tend to face violence uh, in general but not only the, the, the type of sensational violence that we see uh, in the news and on television and the, the very unfortunate uh, loss of life or, or, or six-year-olds in handcuffs, but the suspicion. You know, I remember quite vividly walking down the street with a bat, uh, you know, in a cousin's neighborhood in Marietta, Georgia, and having the police call. But at that point, my uncle had caught up with me. And so, you know, it was me and my uncle walking. And, you know, I was 10 years old and it shook me up because, you know, I'm like, why, why the police, you know, police pulled up and said, Hey, uh, you know, what are you doing? Where are you headed? You know, and people don't, people don't, uh, uh, white people, I, I should say, they don't get that kind of, of just general suspicion, uh, general suspicion of your being in general. And so, you know, I, I find it hard to know your question of, you know, how do we, how do we allow our children to remain children when uh, some of the reality of black childhood is so um, is so warped, and but I'm telling you like this, I certainly intend on my children enjoying and loving their childhood, and 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 very viciously protecting them in the same way that the mother did in this play, because she immediately asked the question, uh, you know, like like uh, Dr. Davis pointed out, you know, how did they treat you? She immediately peaked her antenna when she found out that they named their, their cat Obama, you know, so she knows what she's looking for, and you know, sometimes people. They think that that's an overreaction, but we have to protect black children at all costs because society at large is not doing uh, doing that at all. Perfect, thank you. You reminded me too that um, 
Yes. Yeah, so, so anytime that there is an attachment to uh, that we're uh, made to feel or look or be associated with animals, right? I can't remember what the exact term for that is right now, uh, but w that happens. And so, when you when we find when we find that there's a pet named uh, after a person, right? That's a black person, right? That's going to pique our interest. We're gonna get. Uh, we're gonna ask. We're gonna follow up with more questions about that. I need to know if I need to come get you, right? <laughs> or if you can ever go back. I need to get there. <laughs> or if you can ever go back over there. Right, and you're not going back. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so that, that does bring up a couple of different uh, questions for me. Um, when was the first time, I'll open this up to anyone. Kat, we haven't heard from you, anyone. Um, when was the first time that you had to have this conversation with your children. I remember uh, with my daughter that it was much younger than I thought it would be before mm -hmm. I had children, right? Um, and so I'm curious to know, um, Kat, and let's just open it up for you first. And then if anybody else wants to answer that question, um, when did you have, to, when was the first time you had to have this conversation? Um, we, I guess, a more in-depth conversation, of course, we had this year um, in light of everything that's going on in terms of social justice and, and racism. And we were very intentional about sitting our children down and talking very frankly in a child-appropriate language, of course, about the state of affairs in our country right now. And we used tools to help us navigate the conversation, allowed our children to ask questions. We actually, on one occasion, used CNN, Sesame Street's town hall. They did two, one on COVID and one on racism. And so we, because our kids are young, and it's like some of the other panelists have mentioned that balance that black parents or, or, or parents of children of color have to balance these very heavy and very serious topics with the fact that our kids are still young. You know, we have a second, we had a second grader at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we watched it together as a family, talked about the issues um, that were presented in the Sesame Street special, and then ask our kids questions and let them ask us questions. And that conversation led to questions about how Black people got here. We ended up visiting with our ch children about the slave trade. We showed them pictures. I mean, very um, direct and honest conversations um, so that they are prepared. And we tried to simultaneously lend them a confidence. I think someone else mentioned that their families um, uh, role in, in, in instilling confidence in them as Black children. Um, mm -hmm. I want to add one other thing before we move, um, move on. The play does a really, really good job of highlighting those conversations that we as parents of Black children have to have. But there's another element that I picked up on in the play and something I, you know, in my opinion, Black families can't be the only families having these conversations, right? So one of the subtitles of this program is addressing race and anti-racism in this country. And if we're going to move from just being, um, having discussions about race to more of an active anti-racism movement, we need allies. And though that would be people, not people of color, white families, also engaging in this dialogue and having conversations with their children. And so, you know, theoretically, part two of this play looks like Cindy's family actually educating themselves and communicating about why is it that Sam doesn't play with water guns in his community, but he plays with them here, and them being very intentional about what that space looks like, what that means, and having the conversation with Cindy so that she understands and what that means for her friend Sam. And that understanding, that empathy, that connection, that relationship then put Cindy's family in an advocacy role. Now we're moving toward anti-racism and 
um, as opposed to operating differently in our different spaces. Sam, the Black family operating one way and having one conversation in their space, and Cindy's family operating in another way in a different space. And those conversations, that perspective leads to the change that we're looking for. And, and the change maybe might be renaming that cat, but um, you know, those are my thoughts. <laughs> hey, Kat, what did you think about how um, Michael's character tries to, um, I don't know, save or help or justify Cindy's family, for, you know, doing the thing, their actions? It's like, no, they're nice. They're kind, you know, it's, it's kind of like what, well, what are your thoughts about that? Because I thought that was interesting that he didn't just, he put the kid in a, in a he, the kid was in the middle and he had to manage it and how the mom and how the, you know, how these families handle it. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it's like you guys have said, the play Every Other Line brought up an issue that we could have a separate panel discussion on. <laughs> and you pointed to something, I mean, on the one hand, he is very innocent. No, this is my friend. I mean, he's a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're having fun. We're having, we're playing with water guns and I get to come over and they've got an iguana for goodness sake. I mean, it's all exciting when you look at it from the perspective of a seven-year-old kid, but he is also being put in the place of an adult. It's what Ryan talked about um, because his mom expected him to be the person to navigate a conversation about racism and injustice with adult white you know white adults and that is not his place he is a seven-year-old um but it is that complexity that balance that we we have and so i just thought you know he's innocent but his circumstances put him in a more mature place than he really ought to be if if all things were perfect but they're not and we know they're not. Um, sometimes our kids are going to have to have um, the knowledge base to have some conversations that they otherwise should not have, but that's not our reality. Um, so those were my thoughts. I'm, like I'm interested that. to see what he does with the next few plays. Like if the other plays deal with older kids, I wonder if he brings up similar things and how does he maybe facilitate or help that kid manage that situation? You know what I mean? Because that's a hard place to be. That is, and we've definitely tried to help our kids navigate dialogues um, and, and, and explaining you know, our position on things so that they understand it. And, and using language that they understand that they would ordinarily do. Um, so, yeah. I'd like to. You know, there's a historical. I'm sorry. Go on, Mike. Run. I, I was just adding that, you know, there, there's some historical, you know, uh, context here. We know that uh, traditionally, uh, seven years old is about the age at which uh, enslaved children will begin uh, officially working. Um, we know from Martin Luther King's story that about that age was when his parents said to him that this child is your friend now, but may no longer be as you all get older. Uh, and so, you know, there's a rude interruption of innocence that black children experience vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, race in America, well, vis-a-vis -vis white supremacy, you know, we can call it what it is. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunate and it is heartbreaking. But at the same time, I understand, you know, for my parents having to instill in you these hard, hard realities. You know, I had a friend, a, a friend in third grade call me the N-word. He didn't say the N-word, though. Y'all know where I'm going with this. And uh, his mother called to try to explain. And my dad acted such a fool with that woman because, and I and I was so mad at him, you know, and, and like, you know, how, why did you do that? And then he, my dad, who cusses a lot, said, where the F do you think he got that from? You know, uh, and I was like, huh, oh, okay. I, you know, I, I see where you're going with this. He did. And I mean, you know, um, it, it's, it's such an unfortunate balance to have to strike, you know, but again, I, you know, I, I have to insist on, you know, again, um, 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 protecting, you know, my children in general, black children in particular, at all costs. I, I, well, I think might, it's interesting that he, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead please. I just wanted to interject, um, China, my daughter, who's now 36, was uh, in second grade. So these sevens just keep coming up. She was in second grade in Los Angeles, California in um, the LA County School District. And the N-word was not used, but 
um, uh, the Latinx students were calling her Chocolat. And, but it was definitely done with negativity um, in mind. And when I think about what we went through, those of us who are in my age group, which I don't think many of you are, but um, because I was, I went through uh, uh, educational system in elementary where it was basically uh, kids who look like me. Uh, there wasn't a lot that um, I was exposed to, but as they intentionally started the busing system when I went to middle school, then for me, those conversations uh, became more um, necessary. Um, also, I'm, I'm differences. When I, when I look at the, just the messages in this play, differences, morals, values, um, and you know, from two totally different families and we compare and contrast uh, what happens in Cindy's home and what ha happens in Michael's home. And the fact that Cindy's there with a mom and dad, I don't know that, you know, just based on the, um, the dialogue, I would assume that it was a single parent home for Michael. And so you have these things that you compare and contrast. And, and as I was listening to, to Kat talk, um, listening is the first word, you know, that's in that first sentence. Are you listening to me? And when we think about just today, um, the dynamics of the families, are parents even there to listen? You know, what is really happening as right now with parents having to go to work and students being left at home? Um, there's, uh, there's a lot that, that plays into that. And, and then there, um, some parents could even miss that, that conversation, that conversation between the mom and the son. And he's talking about all this mom. So caught up. She's not, she was really distracted. She was, you really were so up. right. I just realized like when you said that listening part, cause I was struggling with the fact that he comes up with the song, you know, he's like, mom, maybe we can sing this song when you're, you know, like he's adulting her. And, but, just like what you said, are you listening? And instead of me feeling bad about this mom not taking care of, she was actually though listening to him when he came up with this. So maybe she didn't come up with the solution, but she was definitely constantly there giving him like support and mirroring back to him like, hey, hold on, you know what I mean? I really appreciate what you said about the listening. That really, that makes me excited about this whole, because the piece has a lot of little things. I think the playwright did a great job of making it not so simple. You think, oh, it's 12 pages, nothing, you know, whatever. But it's a complex subject. He didn't like take too many sides, but he, he worked in a lot of little nuancey things. And just that listening, look at you, Miss Perceptive. I love that. I love that whole idea of listening, because I do, I agree with you. It's the hardest thing as a parent to listen. I mean, one of the reasons, I know this sounds crazy, but one of the reasons why I chose to homeschool early on, granted I changed my mind and it was a struggle, but mm -hmm. the reason why I chose to homeschool, because that's something in me knew that often I wasn't gonna be present. I just know I couldn't be present. So I thought if I took away, sending them away to school, if I made myself have to do it, and Lord have mercy, it was. But still to this day, now that they're in public schools and doing you know, all the things, I'd have to show up every day to myself to go, okay, sit down, just listen to what this girl has to say and don't say anything, you know, just listen. Cause her experience, like your experience was different in elementary, my experience was different in elementary. I was always the only black kid. You know, and so I have a whole different way of being in the world than you. And then these kids, my kids were always, they had, they always knew a black president. Ah, that's a whole different brain development situation. You know, my son, he has, I had to, I kind of sort of had to dig deep and go, wait, hold on. You think you're, you're, you think you're on the same level as everybody else. How do you say that to somebody that, well, the world, yeah, Obama's president, but I mean, how do you do that to somebody to say, mm, you're really not that great, you know, or you are that great, 
but the world doesn't think that. Like I had to actually convince him, not convince him, but you know what I mean? I had to take that away from him in order to make him safe in the world or to make myself feel like he had a sense of the reality of the world because he did not live in the reality. He lived in the Obama belief because he was a kid. And I had to go, yes, he's amazing and you can be that and you all the good things. But then there's also this, you know? Anyway. Thank you so much. That, for, that is just a beautiful exchange. And I, I don't want to cut us off, but we are about out of time. Um, I think that I think that's a beautiful place to end it, though, because we, we're back at the beginning, which is the beginning of the show. You know, are you listening? Are we listening to our children? And 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 when we have to have or does everyone recognize uh, that we are having these very difficult conversations, these very nuanced conversations in very casual run of the mill times of our life when we should not be having to have them, right? Um, and so again, I wanna thank your you for your performance, Verda. Michael, if you're still on, we are all so incredibly proud of you. Please keep it up. You are wonderful um, and you did an amazing job today. Um, thank you for directing Agnolia B. Gay. Um, and thank you to, uh, yes, thank you to um, uh, Ryan Davis, Dr. Davis, and Kat Guest. Thank you all for being here um, and sharing your experiences with us. And also, finally, thank you to Aaron and the Art Center um, for lifting up this performance, this very important conversation. Um, and I will, I will say that to you as well, we're proud of you for doing that. And please keep it up because this kind of recognition um, and validation uh, for the Black community is everything. So um, my name is Janelle McBride again. Thank you for having me, for letting me ask you guys these questions and for walking us through this. Um, everyone, please have a wonderful day. And no matter who you are, no matter what race you are, please have these conversations um, with your kids, especially if you are not Black, right? Have these conversations um, with your family because uh, it's not it's not good enough to be an ally, right? We are not the only ones that should be having this fight, right? We shouldn't be fighting this by ourselves. Uh, so get in there with us and have those tough conversations too. Thanks for being patient with us, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all have Bye -bye. a wonderful Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks for being here. Bye, y'all.